and see if we can get both of these mics running. We're, we're trying things kind of not on the fly, but they don't all work all the time. And so we're trying things. And I think that's probably the most successful thing that's going on tonight is just that we're trying stuff. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. This has been one of the programs that I've wanted to do for a long, long time. You'll see tonight um, a whole series of, of slides, but my family has lived on the property of the Orleans Hotel in, its, in total since 1960. My father and mother-in-law purchased Cottonwood Cottages, which was on the south end of Sp Big Spear Lake, and ran it as a cottage operation for many years, literally right on what was, was as Bob Olson, my father-in-law would say, was the dump because it actually ended up being kind of the swampy area of the, uh, of the property. And we have two homes on the property, wonderful homes. The cottages have been converted now to private um, individual family homes. But it's in the spot where you can literally feel kind of the Orleans Hotel when you wake up in the morning and listen to the birds and see the lake and you know that it was kind of like that. So we started out with a need for a, a title and I kept thinking, all right, how do we do this? It's kind of near my doorstep, and the railroad track is pretty sinuous, the long and winding road to the Orleans Hotel. And what song comes to mind? The Beatles. And guess what song has been running through my head for the last two weeks? My wife probably has heard me humming it, but literally the long and winding road it leads to my door. And you know, it leads to your door too, because this has been the doorway to really the Iowa Great Lakes. And it's been through the Orleans Hotel and many other things around it. But the Orleans Hotel was really the center pivotal piece that started really the Iowa Great Lakes and, and the wonders that we have today. What you're going to hear from me today is you're going to hear about the story of not a singular hotel, because most of us actually think about the Orleans Hotel in the singular. It's not. It's actually five individual hotels. I'm sure all five had their own personality. I'm sure we don't have enough time today to go through all of them. But there literally are five of them. Four that we know of, and one that remains, at least in all the work that I've done, still unknown. I have not found an image of it. And it all begins with the railroads. Now, the period of time we're talking about is 1882. We're talking about the Burlington Cedar Rapids Northern Railroad. And we're talking about the movement of all of the railroad thinking into the end of the road, which at that time was Spirit Lake. These were the engines of the era. Those two are both from that era of the, the train program. And you actually see an example of a period railroad map starting in Burlington, um, moving out in a lot of different directions, obviously going to Spirit Lake. The timeline's important. Grab me the my pointer and then grab me the, uh, the LED one here in a bit. Think of it in terms of perspective, because history is always about the perspective of your place and your time in relationship to other places and time. 1855, first railroads in Iowa, period. 1856, plus or minus a little, first settlers in the Dickinson County area. By 1882, the Burlington Cedar Rapids Northern is making it to Orleans. Now that's not a very long period of time, and in most of our lives we can think back 20 and 30 years and know exactly where we were at and what was going on. And in that time, Iowa went from having no railroads to having railroads pushing through and trying to do important things here in, in Northwest Iowa. Interesting little uh, uh, simultaneous thing was the US and Canadian railroads were adopting standard times during that same period. Prior to that, all of the times in the country were individual times based on the railroad, the individual railroads. 
they had their own time clocks and everybody ran by a different time clock. And it wasn't until 1883 that time zones actually came about and you would then start hearing about railroad time. Railroad time didn't start until October 11th, 1883. The Orleans Hotel was open by then. And that's when you had your first time zones and the first standardization across all of the railroad tracks of how the trains would operate so you could make your connections. At one time, Iowa ranked fifth out of all the states in railroads. And of course, we are the great beneficiaries these days based on having it as converted to trails. All driven by competition during that area. And th think of it, think of it in terms of the people coming into the area at that time, they are trying to make a dollar. They're trying to make a million dollars if they can, and they're being very competitive. And the Burlington is in one of those lines, not necessarily in 1882, this is a little bit later, but it shows the relative rela the relationship between railroads and railroad lines next. In total, in this competition, if you went to Lake Minnetonka, where the competition was coming from, by 1885, there are already 33 different hotels to choose from, and they range in rates from $1 to $3 a day. 35 in the Lake Minnetonka area. Next one. And here we are, we're, we're having competition from the Burlington Northern. Every one of these little towns along the way have a depot. Every one of them. And they all have people who are interested in coming to the Iowa Great Lakes to, to learn about what's going on at the Iowa Great Lakes. This particular map extends beyond that. So in Minneapolis, in the, in the area around Lake Minnetonka, you have, in this case, the Hotel Lafayette, the big one, the one in the upper right-hand corner, and then the one up right in the middle at the top is the Hotel Lake Park. And the reason it's significant is because the proprietor, the Hutchinsons, came from that particular hotel. And actually, the first year of the Orleans Hotel occupation and, and operation, they ran the hotel in the middle top as well as the Orleans Hotel next slide. So a little bit of perspective here around the lake. So as the train's coming in, obviously we're coming in right down here at Orleans. If you look along the, the west side of the lake, it's owned by private individuals, not in individual lots. Templar Park is not there. It says Spirit Lake Park. There is no road beyond the area up here around Buffalo Run. There are no roads around the east side, all privately owned. Nothing across the northern tip. Everything's happening down here. The Knights Templar are not on Templar Park yet. So here we are, we're back to this timeline of hotels. Let's talk about Hotel One. Hotel One was grand. It was built in the style of the Minnetonka, uh, Lake Minnetonka hotels. It was 350 feet long. The verandas at different levels were estimated to be 3,000 feet in length total, 16 feet wide. So you were able to not only walk around every level on a veranda, but you could also go here to the roof to an observation deck that we'll see later. There were two hotel managers from the period 1883 to 1889. The Hutchinsons came in first, ran it for the longest period of time, and then the Abel family, which was another family related to the, uh, working for the Burlington uh, Cedar Rapids Northern Railroad out of Keokuk, who came in and leased it for the last period that it, of its operation in 1895 to 1899. Next slide. Another view, this is looking south. Now, this is a location that exists still to this day, and you'll see some comparison images here pretty soon. But take a look at this. This is the hotel under construction, 1882. And you still see construction material around. It's not been painted yet. Um, and you can see the, the extent of it. I mean, this is, this is 350 feet from side to side. Next slide. You have this image right here. This is a very rare promotional um, 
lithograph that, that came, and I've only seen a couple of them in, in all of my experience. This came off of an image from, uh, face, or from eBay, uh, one that I didn't buy. It sold for about $500. Next slide. The shirt. The promotional brochure from 1883 for this hotel was in multiple colors. 1883, they produced it in multi-colors. We produced it as a shirt. It's a fundraiser out of Cables Trading Post and Lodge for the Spirit Lake Protective Association. Slide. This just shows some of the images from the brochure itself. The nice lithographs that are in fact showing the kind of activities that they were promoting. Hunting and fishing were major, recreation and major, swimming and also just therapeutic waters. There was a real effort at the time to really talk about Spirit Lake as being something that was therapeutic. The name itself kind of gave a sense of mystique and, and ultimately there was actually a sanitarium that was there that was attracting folks who worked on, at that time, some fairly interesting medicine. Next slide. <laughs> One of the things that I can't, I couldn't get into as well as I wanted to, and it actually creates a lot of the, um, the real interest about the opening was the ceremony itself is well documented in the Spirit Lake Beacon. And what you will find is you will find that there were representatives that came from Georgia, including the governor of Georgia, for the opening of the Orleans Hotel One. Also dignitaries from completely along the line of the Burlington. And interestingly enough, one of the groups that played was the Knights Templar Orchestra out of Cedar Rapids. And I believe, and haven't actually proven it yet, but I believe that that's a significant element to the later development of Knights Templar and Templar Park later on in, uh, uh, on the west shore of Spirit Lake. The little Romans 13, 12 saying was actually read at the ceremony. There was a whole series of readings that are actually documented in the Spirit Lake Beacon. They're very interesting to read. It was quite, quite the show. So, observation deck. We've seen this one. Go on, Mary. Another angle looking at kind of another portion of it, but notice now it's been painted white. They serve some really fancy foods. I, I couldn't even begin to think of 1883 going in and asking for frog legs that were breaded with tartar sauce, or short ribs of beef, or boiled capon, or boiled lake pike. And the, the orchestra was playing. And I actually pulled that music and was trying to integrate it into this presentation. But I got to the point where I was worried about copyrights. And so I decided that probably what I should do is not do it, but there is a whole series of music still available that actually would go through and allow you to get the sense of what was going on at, at the opening ceremony because it's well described in the Spirit Lake Beacon. Any idea of the prices? The, I'm sorry? The prices of those orders and No, actually I didn't. I didn't get any, anything uh, that gave me clues to price at all. Was it included in the daily it was part of what you got for being a, a daily uh, participant. This is from the observation deck. And this is actually looking to the west. And if you see the whole postcard, the whole image, you'll find that there's only trees along the shoreline. And pretty much everything back here that would be to the, to the west and south it is tree, almost treeless. Not totally treeless, but almost treeless. 18, obviously, 1882, 1883. Next slide. Part of the promo, this was what brought people here. They came in large part to go fishing and they had been coming to Spirit Lake, Big Spirit Lake to go fishing for a long time because Crandall's Lodge on the North Shore, earlier known as Hunter's Lodge or at least a version as Hunter's Lodge was a destination for a lot of folks even before the railroads came into the area and they actually rode Stage coaches and horseback uh, into the area to hunt and fish long before um, the Orleans Hotel was ever finished. But this was used heavily as part of the promotional for bringing people there. Next slide. And you could come on the train, you could buy around trips. They even had a train that came out of Des Moines 
in the evening on Friday at six o'clock, went drove or came all of, uh, overnight, completely overnight, dropped off the business men and women on Saturday morning so they could spend the entire day Saturday and most of the day Sunday um, at the lakes and then they would turn around and they'd drive them back on Sunday night overnight on a on a birthing car uh, and they run that train every week coming to this 1880s era hotel another thing that you run into that you can't you just can't imagine how much how many rabbit holes you can go down into I somewhat chuckle that I've done a, a lot of rabbit hole chasing here of late to the point where my wife was actually kind of wondering if I was ever going to get outside and work in the garden or do any of the other fun stuff that we need to be doing to get ready for spring. Part of what you're dealing with is you're dealing with the individuals themselves and the storylines behind them and it ends up being pretty fascinating. I could tell several stories there, couldn't I Mary? One of the stories that is an important one for us to keep in mind and perspective to this first Orleans Hotel is the Queen came to Big Spirit Lake first. It came in 1883, it came in parts, it didn't come as a whole. It came as the hull that was built at the Iowa Iron Works in Dubuque and it came as a series of pieces of cabin building car shops in Cedar Rapids of that era. Now, car shops at that time weren't motor car shops. That's 1883. They're actually running around with buggies, building the buggies out of Cedar Rapids. Launches on the lake in July of 3rd of 1883. It was brought here by the Spirit Lake Hotel and Navigation Company, which was a consortium of individuals here locally who were moneyed well enough to put together this business to basically deal with the transportation, not only to the Orleans Hotel, but also between the Orleans Hotel and other points around the area. Many of us may know the Queen stayed on the lakes until 1973 when it went down to Adventureland in the Des Moines area. I don't know its status now, some of you may, but this was the Queen as I would remember it. I know Bill Moss and I both remember when working for Lake Patrol in the early 70s. Next slide. But in April 6 of 1900, it moved off of Big Spirit Lake, and at, by that time, hotel number one was closing down, was closed down basically for good. Why did that happen? The biggest part that's talked about in the literature is that the dropping of the lake level. From its high point, Big Spirit Lake was estimated to be down eight feet from its high. Now, I can't imagine that, because I know what eight feet down would look like having gone out on that lake a lot with the depth finders. It would be a pretty dry lake, but that was what's reported in the literature. And the company that had built it, the railroad, was seeing that happen, and they didn't like the potentials that it was going to hold for them. There was also several economic downturns in the country, and there were panics of called panics at that point in 1884, 93, 96, in which the money was changing. And also, you ended up with the fights that were going on right at that same time over alcohol. Iowa actually became a dry state by constitutional amendment in 1882, before the Orleans Hotel opens. One of the things you'll find replete in the literature are discussions of the Orleans Hotel in the context of the illegal alcohol trade. And on occasion, there were quite a few folks who were getting arrested or attempts to be made to be arresting them and the fights that were going on, many of them well documented within Spirit Lake Beacon. And a temperance group, of course, that was out saying, you know, look what they're doing up there, they're, that's bad. And it was part of what was going on throughout the whole country and it was part of the reason these big hotels, these luxury hotels, ended up ultimately failing. The end of the road hotels just had a changing landscape. And then locally, the inn came into town on West Okoboji in 1896. And it lasted much longer, much longer. And it's the inn version, the early one, and the new inn version later on as it was, as it was developed. Go ahead, Mary. 
So here they are. They're bundled up and they are heading out back east. And all the stuff from the first Orleans Hotel was bundled up and moved back east. And this location is right at the intersection of 140th Avenue over here on the left and East Lake Road, the east side of the north end of East Lake. And the actual base for that tank still is, still is there. So if you were to wander over there, you could actually find that location precisely. And now, of course, that's the trail, part of the Iowa Great Lakes Spine Trail. Next slide. So from 1900 to 1906, there really wasn't an Orleans Hotel period, end of subject. But John Burmeister's in town. And John Burmeister is building the, or, uh, the Antlers Hotel. And in 1902, the Antlers Hotel comes into being during this kind of down period between Orleans hotels. And the Antlers is a big deal. And Burmeister has come to town and made it a big deal. And the Queen moves to Okoboji. And then from the old Orleans Hotel that's being torn down, there are cottages around here that are probably still built from some of the material that was in the original Orleans Hotel. Can't say where, but they didn't just burn it up. They actually talk about disposing of it uh, through cottages. So if we have cottages on Big Spirit Lake that date back from around 1900 to 1910, I would suspect there's a good chance that some of the wood in them would have been from the Orleans Hotel. And John Burmeister builds this. He calls it the Antlers. And night that period is just kind of the Antlers period. Next. But now we move into number two. They decide they're going to build another Orleans Hotel. And look who's doing it. John Burmeister. Something gets in his craw that maybe there needs to be a hotel up there, and it needs to be pretty fancy, so let's build another one. And so he sells the antlers. In fact, it's kind of a raffle that he gets rid of it with. Interestingly enough, they talk about it. I haven't gotten too far down that rabbit hole yet, but it's an interesting one. And he comes, and he ends up being the manager of Arlene's Hotel Number 2. Next slide. Again... A pretty grand object. It's got dormers. Characteristic of those dormers that there's four panes of glass in them, and there are only five on this side. There's a whole bunch on the other side. It's still three stories. It's still got a very nice veranda. The road's still mud. Everything is horses around there. This is 1907 from a postcard. Another angle of Hotel 4. This is looking from the north side, looking south, to the west end of it, uh, a dock. Go on, next slide. This one's looking from the east end, looking to the west. And I want you to pay particular attention to this structure right here. Next slide. Because in the winter, if you've ever lived on the south shore of Big Spear Lake, <laughs> I have. That's probably a nine or ten foot snowdrift, and I've seen those. They actually, it's, it's like living in the Arctic. <laughs> when in town, my sister-in-law says, oh, the wind's not even blowing. And I'm going, yeah, right. We've got no, we no visibility at all. That's a postcard from 1907. If you notice, that's okay. You notice this hotel only lasts from 1906 to 1908. This is an event that would have been held towards that 1908 period. Fred Gilbert was a trap shooter, a world-renowned trap shooter in the area, and he collaborated with the Flandreau Sioux tribes, uh, actually a couple of them, and they would bring both uh, some of the Sioux uh, trap shooters into the area, and Fred Gilbert would bring folks from the local area. There was a lot of trap shooting that was going on even back in that era. And they'd have a competition on the South Shore right there in front of the hotel. The hotel actually sits right back over here. And these are all Orleans Hotel, uh, probably hay for boats. Next. There we go. There we go. Someone asked about the boathouse. In fact, we have a member of the family, I think, that speaks, that, that had ties to this. But there's the boathouse, there was a swimming area. Look at there, there was actually a, 
uh, slide that was on the South Shore. And again, this is hotel number four. Pretty grand. All right, now we get to three. Hotel number three is really unknown, and I would love to have somebody find me a photograph of Hotel Three. Hotel Three is unknown for kind of an interesting reason. Go ahead, Mary. Because if you look at it, Hotel Burns, Hotel Two Burns, January 31 of 1908. They lay the foundation for Hotel Number Three on December 4th, 1908. And Hotel Number Three burns May 10th, 1909. Five months. It's not even in full, it's, it's ready to open May 15th, but on May 10th it burns. It, it's not even a hotel other than for a long enough period of time for someone to get a camera out, as far as we can tell. So if you find it, it's a rare event. Go ahead, Mary. As I read through it, I was trying to come up with a reason why, you know, maybe it got burnt, maybe, maybe. Well, one of the things that was new to me was that Guy Burnside, who becomes, but he had been the curator of the, and the, and the uh, owner of the Antlers Hotel. He also then takes on the Orleans Hotel. He's talking about changing the name about the time that the Hotel Number 3 comes up, and he wants to call it the Anglers Inn. But for some reason, community spirit, and I can't imagine that they're using Facebook, <laughs> you end up having community spirit basically generate enough opposition that he keeps Orleans Hotel as the name. And I'm just wondering if maybe somebody decided that during that period of confusion that maybe they should burn it, but I don't know. <laughs> Next. Okay, so now we're gonna go to four. This is Orleans Hotel number four. Guy Burnsides and his wife Mabel, they actually start the acquisitions in about 1909 and they own that hotel until Guy Burnside passes away in 1931. Mabel, his wife, continues, even though she thinks that she should just convert the property to cottages. That's what her statement in the newspaper was. That it should go to cottages. But they went ahead and they, they built another one in 19, roughly 1910. And they actually were very good promoters. And what you start seeing, you start seeing things that are a little more you know, contemporary, I guess I would use the word, a fountain, a fountain bed. They use advertising that's a bit more photographic in nature, probably just a representative of the changes that were going on in the technology. But the promotions are bathhouses, boating, a concert orchestra, which they kept for quite some period of time, Automobiles were a big deal, and so they were having garages. The best fishing in Iowa, they have, still have a water toboggan. The dance pavilion starts to come on, and the steamboats were still coming up on the East Lake side and providing rides for folks down into West Lake. And that's kind of what it looks like. In the 30s, this is about a 1930 uh, Ford Gingham Inn. Next side. Another angle, you can see more dormers on this one, two panes of glass rather than four. Um, mud road, if you look hard over to the right, you can see the steam engine and that's where one of the steam towers is at. Probably related to the Frank Marnet period of time. Next slide. Another angle, next slide. Backside, this is looking to the south from the north side. Next slide. One of the things they touted was that each one of these dormers opened up wide enough that they gave fresh air to every one of the rooms. And so as you were occupying a room, of course you didn't have air conditioning, that was one of the big features. Next slide. And during the motor car period, I'd love to know who this is and I would love to be able to figure out precisely what year, but it's probably about a 1911, 1912 car. Um, with, with a sign that I can't quite read. I assume it's part of the pavilion, but I don't know that for a fact. Next slide. After the Burlington Cedar Rapids Northern leaves, it's essentially the, the property of the Rock Island. It's it officially it is the Chicago Rock Island um, and Pacific, but most everybody called it just the Rock Island. 
And it was until its demise in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s. But a ticket, and you could take a ticket and ride from shore, a big spirit lake actually had a role of some significance in helping train the then to be wonders of the Berkeley and Company. Uh, it may have been a small role, but it was a role that was, I think, at least significant. Next slide. On the site of the current spillway drive-in, a tennis court, a covered area for people to gather, the dance pavilion. Next slide. Changes over time. Gingham Inn, a gas station literally right where the drive-in is, right, the driveway is right now, and the dance pavilion. And the dance pavilion was a pretty fancy thing. They brought in orchestras, big band sound from all over the Midwest. Next slide. So it was a pretty grand hotel itself, and it was hotel number four. But we weren't done yet. Go on. Next. Two railroad tracks, don't know how many of you realize, but there actually were two tracks, a side track that occurred there. Um, you don't see the evidence of it anymore, the single track, or was. Next slide. Fishing being a big deal, these are, these are folks filling up a, a reefer car, a refrigerated railroad car, with buffalo fish. There's a whole different genre of discussion about the fishing that was going on, both uh, sport fishing and commercial fishing, that hopefully will be a subject to another discussion sometime. But this is an illustration of them filling up probably 20 or 30,000 pounds worth of buffalo fish to move it back to the Chicago market in the early days. Excellent. A contemporary image and a, and a 1914 image, same beach. Here was the toboggan slide. Now we got um, uh, shore, shore station docks or shore station hoist sitting on it. Next slide. So I mentioned that Guy Burnside was more of a marketer. I actually found this on eBay. Guy, it's an envelope um, that Guy Burnside used to communicate with folks. He actually ran the hotel uh, from 1910 until 1931 when he passed away. Next. And it was pretty interesting to get this information from 1915 from uh, Ancestry.com on the census from Iowa talking about Guy Burnside. He had made $2,000 in 1914 on the Orleans Hotel. That was what he declared, at least. <laughs> he owed 15000 on it, and it added declared value of 30000 in 1914 dollars. So it gives you a sense of scale. Um, and at that point, he's 43, he has 15 more years to, to be in operations. But it shows him as a hotel business person Next slide. This is an interesting image. Actually, it was kind of the, one of the first directories for the local area that shows ownership by number across all of these houses. The Orleans Hotel in its fifth configuration and the um, um, dance hall, the pavilion there, and a lot of other interesting, interesting pieces. If you had a chance to dig into the names, it's very uh, interesting slide. Next one. Okay, so let's go to the fifth one. Start to wrap this up. So Guy Burnside passes, Mabel's got it. She wants to turn it into cottages. She doesn't, she ends up rebuilding the, or taking over the hotel. It burns again in 36. Uh, and that burned from a, from a kitchen fire um, that apparently got into the wall and they thought they'd gotten it out and they didn't and it flared back up and it burned. It didn't burn it completely so they had a lot of leftover wood and they ended up going and building a fifth Orleans Hotel rather than cottages. She ran it until 1939 and when it was sold to Mr. and Mrs. F. E. Weatherly out of Clear Lake. And then it was owned and operated by the Weatherleys for a short period of time they sold it to N.G. Gerg, who I don't, I'm not able to find a whole lot about, but he was a hoteler in the area. And then they sold it to the family that we knew, 
Marsha and Jolene and Sandra all grew up with the Iselt family. Bought by the Iselts in late 1955. Next slide. And this is what it looked like basically when they bought it in late 1955. The Iselt family, Robert Iselt, Dr. Robert Iselt, actually was an osteopath out of the Ocheden area. And they spent time commuting back and forth and living here on the weekends and running this as a hotel from about 1956 to 1967 when they converted it into a single family home. Next slide. A little bit clearer image, same thing. Uh, for us, a characteristic set of steps that now, of course, are gone. This area right here, the spillway drive-in's at. Next slide. Property was sold. Next slide. Aerial, oops, sorry. Aerial view showed relative locations of places. One of the most important pieces that had been an add-on during that era was the Royal Orleans Club. And my father-in-law spoke of being able to go over there and go to the dances. And it was part of the era when they learned the big band music. Because big bands from all over Iowa and probably Minnesota and South Dakota came to play at the Royal or Orleans. This is an image dated by the cars from about 1937. Next slide. Some things that were advertised, they had food, which would be nice to have, you know, oh, that's right, there is a spillway drive in there. Did I say that before? They had a lot of opportunities for people to participate there, not only uh, fishing and hunting, but the dancing and, and actually the sale of uh, gasoline. Next slide. One of the Iselt family members, still a f very good friend, uh, loaned the images that they actually received early on in their um, ownership of the property, showing kind of what the hotel looked like in its very early days with the awnings and the like, and that was when they probably were operating it as a hotel during that 19... 56 to 1967 period. Next slide. Interesting thing, I've been an eBayer for many, 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 many years, and these are the door numbers from the Fifth Orleans Hotel that somehow or other ended up on eBay and I bought them. <laughs> Next slide. Dr. Iselt was the owner, he and his wife, um, purchased this property as a family property. I'm sure they were trying to run it as a hotel for as long as they could, but it, it became a very loved family property for a long period of time. Next slide. In fact, it was so loved that in 1956, the first, at that time, called Jim's Drive-In was created right there on the spot of the present day Spillway Drive-In. And this was the anniversary celebration, five years in July of 1960, well advertised in the Spirit Lake Beacon. Next slide. And this is kind of the configuration of it at that time. It never really got modified a huge amount over the years, but from this, there was probably an interim version that got created, and then ultimately the Madigan family did a wonderful job in recreating the current spillway drive-in. Next slide. And this is actually looking from a perspective basis up towards where the majesty, majesty of the first Orleans Hotel would have sat as well. Some of it actually clear out into this area over here. And the fountain itself actually up in this area here, which would have been kind of in where they have their driveway now. This is the home version. This is the illustration of a uh, uh, pencil sketch of the home version from 1967 on till its demise in about 2012 when it was finally demolished. Next slide. Kind of one of the last images that were would have been taken. Next slide. From another angle. Next slide. Little bit of a comparison. Google map of 2018 
1939 aerial. I can't really get into great detail other than the fact that you can see Fifth or or Orleans Hotel over here with the gas station. The gas station was sitting about right in here. The Orleans Hotel right about in here. The, the uh, boat livery right down about in here. And if you see, well, actually over to the left a little further, and you see the pavilion behind the hotel actually sitting right in this area right about here. Those are approximations, but from a comparison perspective, it gives you an idea of kind of the contemporary look and the, the 1939 look. Next slide. The railroad continued on through the 1990s. My wife actually and her sisters went out and put pennies on the track. Every time they'd hear, hear a train coming, they would run over, well, not, maybe not every time, but they would do it often, and they'd run over and put a penny on the track and try to find the penny. And of course, there's probably a lot of flat pennies out there that we could never have found. The trails group might have found them later on. <laughs> but <laughs> it, yeah, it's, <laughs> that's exactly right, a penny at a time. This is part of the teardown. This video is very seldom, have very seldom been seen. Hit it again, Mary. So, so during, the, during the point after it was purchased by the Madigan family, of course it had to be removed. And I'm sure a very sad moment for folks that had lived in that uh, property for so many years. Because if you think about the, the durations, and I think I've got a summary slide there. The, the, go ahead, Mary, move on just to the other one and show a little bit more than excellent. Hit it one more time. There you go. There we go. The one thing that was characteristic, we, we got a short video, we didn't dwell on getting it all, but a few minutes, was the crunching. The wood was so very dry, and as it was being broken, it just snapped. Another interesting thing is Dean and Thelma were gracious and allowed us to take a little bit of the flooring uh, outside of it, and we've made for the family some personal shadow boxes with small chunks of the flooring out of the Fifth Orleans Hotel with some backlit photographs. Go out and marry. If you can get it to move. So here's a contemporary look, same site. I mean, wonderful, right? I mean, nobody's going to doubt that. And second, wonderful. And over in the corner there, the Burmeisters, or not the Burmeisters, the Burnside's home is still there. So in, in terms of the, uh, the longevity of that property, the Burnside home from about 1920 continues to exist. Much of the, uh, well, particularly location-wise, the spillway drive-in exists from 1955 on, and there are a couple other structures, mostly the water tanks, one of the fish hatchery, the one up on the, the base up the, up the road, and the tunnel underneath the railroad tracks are basically what are the current remaining pieces of that era. Next slide. So there you have it. The longest running hotel was a guy in Mabel Burnside from 1909 to 1939, and they actually operated for 30 years as a hotel. But truly the continuous ownership and the championship of ownership has up to this date been the Robert Iselt family from 1955 to 2012, plus or minus a little, 57 years, in the face of everything that we've gone through. The Iselt family and the Fifth Hotel was the one that survived the longest and has probably the most tradition to date and probably the most memories out there in the wilderness. So that's my program. <laughs> you know, there's, as you might imagine, there are many, many things that are missed in that process. There are the people and the stories of the people that aren't being talked about. There are the music that's been played. There are the events that were held. A uh, huge number of different groups would come into the area. And one thing that I didn't say that's relevant that I now remember that I should have said was 
That first, one of those first groups was the Templar, the Knights Templar Orchestra. It was the Orleans Hotel working collaboratively with other groups in the area that brought in the Knights Templar to Templar Park. And it was an agreement that purchased the first 10 acres of land up there at Templar Park and literally gave it to the Knights Templar. And you ended up creating Templar Park off of a donation that was done locally by the people of Spirit Lake, driven by the railroad company and the interest of doing better development in the area that brought the Templars there. And they were there at the first opening of the first Orleans Hotel playing in the band. So interesting little pieces and some things that sometimes you run into that you just don't expect. Questions? Back to the question. I've always heard that one of the hotels in my the question has to do with whether the rumor about a tornado causing the demise of the hotel was true. Actually, there was wind damage. If you've ever lived on the south shore of Big Spirit Lake, you know the wind can blow on occasion. And on that big structure, the very first hotel, remember it was all wood and it was very tall. The damage was to those spires it blew, I'm sure, chunks of wood off of that left and right. And so there was damage occurring probably quite often. They were probably doing quite a bit of repair during those early days, and it probably drove them to realize that maybe that design didn't fit quite well there. That would be my best assessment. You had a question. I did not realize that it was a separate dance pavilion. My parents always talk about coming up for my time. Yeah. Well, Here's a separate pavilion. When the others were down, did the pavilion No, the question is, that was the pavilion separate? Yeah, and so the answer is yes. The pavilion didn't come online really as a separate location until the 30s, into the 30s. And it only lasted until into the early 60s. Um, the state of Iowa purchased that property actually in late 1955. And I think the teardown was somewhere between 55 and 60 of the pavilion that was in place. And then the parking lot, as we know it, kind of got started, opened up. There was another boat ramp location and la la la, things that we didn't talk about. But, but the pavilion was mostly that particular one, although they had dancing, but dancing wasn't as much of a, a big thing um, in a separate building until then. It was in the, the hotel itself that the orchestras came. Yeah. Well, that's what I think. Back in the back. When was the spillway? When, the question is, when was the spillway formed? Well, there's various iterations of the spillway, but if you go back to the very earliest of these photos, the aerial ones, the ones that you can actually see, 19, 1908, 1909, there is a waterway running through there. There's a couple photos that I don't have included here that are actually showing flooding conditions through there from both directions right by the boathouse, right by Nelson's boathouse. Um, so there was a path and there was, a, there was water going through and if you look at some of those aerials, you'll see it. The spillway itself didn't get created until in the 40s. And the actual metering of the height of Spirit Lake itself kind of varied a bit, but the USGS finally ended up setting the height levels in the 40s on that and that's when the, the concrete edge that we see at the spillway, which we talk about being the top, the, the lake height. And when we're looking at all of the height of the lake that's in relationship to that concrete spot. Other questions? Uh, one of the things you were talking about, the Icell family. Uh, when the Icell family got ready to sell, they did offer it to the state of Iowa to begin with. but. DNR didn't have the money to buy it, and it just kind of died then. So the comment, I don't know if everybody has heard it, but the comment basically being that the state of Iowa was given an opportunity to purchase, and I know there was some talk about putting an office building over there yes. and the like, but of course it didn't happen. And you know what? I really like the spillway driving. <laughs> so did Bobby. <laughs> Other questions, anybody? Well, I thank you all. Oh, wait, Terry, you have a question? The Burnside family was quite prominent in Super Bowl. So he finished the agreement with that. 
Not that I know of, because they were from, this particular group was out of Illinois. Uh, and he, was, he and his wife both are buried back in Illinois. Uh, but I can't say there was no relationship. One of the things I did find is that in the first hotel, one of the proprietors was a Hutchinson. And if you look at some of the later ones, there's Hutchinson's ice cream, which was an early version of probably Wells Blue Bunny type ice cream for the era. And I'm not sure it wasn't part of the same family there as well. So, and one more. Uh, in East Lake, yes. 1936 is really the 3536 is the period when East Lake was photographed being as almost dry. It's kind of riverlet down through the middle. And uh, Bill Boss is saying that 1899, there's an image that also shows it very low, which would have been coinciding with the era when they were making predictions that Big Spirit Lake's going to go dry. In fact, one of the things that's really interesting if you read into the literature is there were serious considerations, and I'm, I'm with Spirit Lake Protective Association these days very proudly, but Spirit Lake Protective Association of that era was starting to talk about diverting the entire flow of the Little Sioux River from up there into the north end above Loon Lake and dropping it down through Big Spirit Lake down through the whole system. We'd have the whole river. It would fluctuate a little bit, but we'd have it, and we didn't. We didn't get it. Well, thank you, folks. I appreciate everybody's attendance this evening. I hope you enjoyed the program as much as I've enjoyed putting it together.